I'm Sue Whittington. I'm really thrilled to be here today. The energy is so wonderful, and seeing all of you interact with the authors is fabulous, but hearing what the authors have to say about interacting with you all is even better. The Library Foundation of Martin County hosts the Kiplinger Literacy Award Luncheon every year. It's a premier event highlighting the power of reading and the entrepreneurial and philanthropic achievements of some of the most successful literary advocates in our area. This year, former foundation board chair and well-known community philanthropist Noreen Fisher was honored. And believe me, that was well-deserved. I wanted to have Noreen stand up today and be recognized, but I think you'll find this interesting. She had already committed to a year-long volunteer gig at the, vol at the uh, Moorgate Library in Port Salerno working with specific children. So she's out volunteering at the library right now instead of being here. So let's give her a round of applause. I told her she had to watch the video afterwards. Our next panel is Love, Friendship, and Ever Afters, moderated by Linda Weixnar. Linda is an attorney, shareholder, and head of the Marital and Family Law Department at Curry Buchanan. Some fun facts about Linda. She's a fellow Rotarian, a graduate of Duke University and Georgetown Law School, a former Olympic torch carrier, and a founding member of Impact 100 Martin. Linda was honored as the Seroptimist International Woman of Distinction in Business in the year 2020. She loves to read and learn, and she's a masterful storyteller. So this next panel is going to be very interesting. Buckle up and welcome Linda to the stage with her authors, Ashley Poston, Eleanor Lippman, and Jean Meltzer. Hi everybody, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. These are, this is my second time as a moderator and I mention that only because um, one of the ladies that I'm gonna introduce for you, her introduction comes from one of last year's panelists. Um, so I, first I'd like to introduce Ashley Poston who is at the far end. <laughs> Hi everyone. <laughs> Ashley Poston started writing when she was in middle school. She never stopped. She graduated from the University of South Carolina and went on to work in the publishing industry as both a social media coordinator and then a marketing designer and now a full-time author. And we're very happy about that choice. Her young adult novels have appeared on the Indie Next list multiple times, have been featured in Teen Vogue, Seventeen, Entertainment Weekly, Hypable, BuzzFeed, and in the Goodreads Choice Awards. Her first adult novel, The Dead Romantics, that we're talking about today, was Good Morning America's July Book Club pick, Barnes & Noble's fiction pick for July, an Amazon editor choice, and Cosmo named it one of the 60 best romantic books to warm you right up. When not writing, she plays Dungeons and Dragons and reads copious amounts of fanfic. She bides her time between New York and South Carolina and all the bookstores in between. Um, one thing that you'll learn about her is that she lives in a small gray house with too many plants and never enough coffee. And this Friday, she will welcome two new cats to her charming home. I'm so happy. <laughs> Our second author, Eleanor Lipman, the lovely lady in the middle. She is, so Eleanor's introduction was written by Kristen Harmel, who um, runs a, a group on Facebook where you can meet other authors. It's really pretty wonderful. And Kristen was one of our authors here last year. And of all the introductions I read about Eleanor, I like this one the best, so I'm totally stealing it. Known for her keen wit, Eleanor Lippman is a master of social satire and has written 16 books, including The Inn at Lake Divine, Rachel to the Rescue, Good Riddance, and one of Mary Kay Andrews' all-time favorite books, The Family Man. Her debut no novel, Then She Found Me, was made into a movie starring Helen Hunt, Bette Midler, Colin Firth, and Matthew Broderick. You can still find it. A writing professor who has taught at Simmons, Smith, and Hampshire Colleges, Eleanor has been a fiction judge for the National Book Awards and has been on the literature panel for the National Endowment for the Arts. Today she's going to join us to discuss her latest novel, Ms. Demeanor. It was released in late January by Harper Perennial. 
was chosen as the Barnes & Noble fiction pick for the month of January and has been called a complete and utter delight by Richard Russo and sexy and fun, breezy and engrossing by Tom Parada. Uh, the Chicago Tribune called her the last urbane romantic. Now that's not from Kristen Harmel's. I found that somewhere else, but I just loved it so much that you don't <laughs> hear too. the word urbane too. too much. So, uh, and, and, and having now met Eleanor and spent a little time with her, it's really just the perfect description. And Jean here immediately to my right has the unique distinction of being the world's only Emmy Award winning, chronically ill and disabled rabbinical school dropout. That's a lot. <laughs> Um, it is this extraordinary background coupled with a firm belief in holding on to your joy and seeking out happy endings which forms the basis of her diverse work. She also has become an outspoken advocate for myalgic encephalomyelitis, a chronic fatigue syndrome. In 2012, she ended her rabbinical studies and spent many years homebound because of this disease. But today, Jean lives a thriving, chronically fabulous Jewish life in Virginia. She sees her challenges as part of a larger journey and is eager to share her stories with others. She is the author of the international best-selling book, The Matzo Ball, currently in development to be a feature film, and Mr. Perfect on Paper. Her third book, Kissing Kosher, will be available August 29, 2023. So as you know, at the end, you'll have the opportunity to bring up some questions for our authors, so please think about them and have them ready for when it's time for us, for you guys to get to question, but at first, I get to do the questioning. So ladies, having read each of your books, uh, what strikes me first is that they're not just about your straight girl meets boy wedding bells ring. It, they're all about family and not just nuclear family, but the family that you choose for yourself and not just you know, upline and downline mothers and daughters and children, but they're about the, the um, grandmothers and um, cousins and people that you meet along the way and how those people all become part of your tapestry. So is this something, this type of a, a chronicle, something that you approach intentionally or is it, do they just come out that way? Ashley, let's start with you. No, I start first, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, for me, um, writing romance or love stories is about not only like falling in love with the person you're meant to be with, but also in love with like, with your community, with your family, with your way of life, with your career. Falling in love, like it, for me, every story in existence is some sort of love story, right? Um, whether it's with someone else or like a love of like the author with a genre or with uh, or with like a, a love of crime, right? Which was like the last panel. So, um, so yeah, for me, when I go in writing a romance, I look at the relationships and every relationship I view as a different kind of romance. Um, and yeah, so that's, uh, that's how I do it. <laughs> and I love writing about community and family and strong ties. Eleanor? Well, I, I don't set out to do anything. I just sort of, you know, write one sentence at a time. But I think what influences, I grew up in an exceedingly functional family. So I had devoted parents. They were older in their 40s when they had me and my sister. So I think that comes in. And I think, you know, my, I often write first person narrator. And I think that a lot, I try not to do this, but I think there's a, I can say sort of about particular characters or, you know, maybe c'est moi. And uh, so I am, um, you know, I, I feel that I want to satisfy the reader. I don't, I'm not going to drown anyone's children in, in my books. So I would think You drown them with love. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I feel that I am, and also there's, you know, the great example of William Shakespeare, we're all, because I'm considered, I don't write romance, but it's considered romantic comedy, and that there's the great tradition of William Shakespeare, his comedies all end with a wedding, so nothing wrong with that. And Jean, how do you approach it? So we have a saying in the uh, Jewish world, maybe this is in the outside the Jewish world too, which is, yeah, sure. When you marry a Jewish girl, you marry their family. 
And I think that speaks very much to sort of Jewish culture in our world. Um, our love stories, it's not just marrying each other, it's marrying the family, it's Lador Vador from generation to generation. And you can't really write, in my mind, a Jewish romance from a Jewish worldview without including the Jewish community. So now, Ashley, you don't have to go first this time, so you get a, a breather. <laughs> Each of you has been described as quirky. How do you feel about that? Not you personally, sorry. Each of your books oh, has I'm, been... Oh, I'm, I'm glad you <laughs> yeah, clarified that. <laughs> sorry. The, the, and really, not just the books that we're talking about today, but you know, sort of the greater picture, including your back catalogs, the word quirky comes up a lot. And so, Ashley, what I hear about you is voicey and quirky. And, mm -hmm. and Eleanor, what I hear about you is the, the dialogue is so natural and it's quirky. And Jean, you know, we hear about you that it's, it's funny and it's true to life and it's quirky. So, but I don't think any of you started out saying, oh, I'm going to write a quirky book. So when you see this, how do you feel about that? I love quirky. I think quirky is another word for original. I think that it is saying that um, maybe slightly unexpected. And so I like it very much. I, I think quir quirky is also a stand-in for, uh, for comedic. Uh, because people don't want to be like, oh, this is like comedy. Oh, it's quirky because yes. quirky is lighthearted and fun. But I think I think they're just they're they're synonymous to each other. I like that. Thank you. And I think um, for me, maybe you guys feel this way too. I feel like in my books, because of the intersectionality of identity with invisible disability and Judaism, sometimes uh, because it's so unique it feels quirky to people. But how we make it feel less unique is we just keep putting more of those types of stories out there. So we put stories with chronic illness out there. We put stories with mental health issues out there. We put Jewish stories out there. And then I think after a while, they won't be considered quirky anymore. They'll just be part of the canon. So Jean, I'm so glad you said it exactly that way because your first book, The Matzah Ball, which was fantastic and funny, um, uh, sh that woman, she's neurodivergent. She's got some illness going on, but um, she, and I'm not, this is not a spoiler. You'll read about this like in the first five pages of the book. She's a Jewish woman who loves Christmas and she writes Christmas romance novels. Um, and then in the second book, um, Dara has, she's got uh, a chronic illness and, but she's also, you know, her Jewish heritage is, is right out there. And your third book that's coming out in August, she's got a chronic illness, yes. and the Jewish heritage is really very much a part of the story. Um, so is this something that you intend to make at sort of the forefront of each of your novels? Absolutely. Um, I've been sick since I was 18 years old. I've been uh, homebound for the last 10 years, and for two of those years, I was completely bedbound. My biggest event was a half hour trip to the grocery store, maybe once every two months. As I like to say, if you think lockdown was bad, imagine that for two years. Um, and one of the hardest parts about being diagnosed at 18 or being that sick was that I had no models for what life with chronic illness looked like. To this day, we don't see chronic illness on television in books and film. Um, so for me, part of this missionhood of this place that I've been given to write these books is to not only provide models, but to be, be a voice for all the invisible, the millions missing that are sitting at home who don't have a voice for themselves. So I will continue advocating for the chronically ill, for the disabled, the chronically disabled, and for those with mental health challenges. And you've talked that one of the very important things to you about that topic is changing the language, how we approach it, and not talking about chronic illness, because it's not a, a cold, it's not the sniffles, but you know, sort of coming up with a language that really is much more descriptive. Um, and I think your, your books work on that as well. And really, they don't, they're not normalizing illness, but they're making it you know, sort of part of everyday life. And that's the reality. What I tell people all the time is, when I talk about my day with chronic illness, I'm not being depressing. That is just my day. Um, and so for these characters, I think it's really important to understand that it's not on a binary of health versus sickness. 
uh, people with chronic illness, we learn to adapt to functioning at 30, 50, 70 percent. Uh, we don't get better, we don't get cured because we show up to something. We have just adapted to the model of living with an illness. But that means we can still do amazing things. I am married, I have books, I won an Emmy, um, I lived in Israel for two years. I, my life has been fuller in many ways because chronic illness taught me that my mort mortality uh, young. And so for all the bad that chronic illness brings, it also brings, it can bring a tremendous amount of good. So that also I want to put out there is a message of hope that you can still have your happy ending even if you're sick. And we're going to circle back around to this a little bit more, but Ashley, I wanted to ask you, you also sometimes have neurodivergent characters in your novels. Yes, and of course, in the current one, mm -hmm. um, she, again, not a spoiler, she speaks and sees ghosts. So <laughs> I wouldn't call that neurodivergent. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, but um, I do personally have an anxiety disorder, and I um, I have chronic pain as well. A lot of my um, a lot of my contemporaries do. A lot of authors do. It's kind of one reason why we all decided to be authors is because it's stationary for a lot of what we do. Um, and I think it's important to put that into my novels. I don't ever actually call out, oh, um, my name is Florence Day and I have an anxiety disorder. It's, it's never that prominent. It's more like, because I write first person narratives, it's in how she talks and how she feels and how some of her uh, paragraphs kind of spin out a little bit. Kind of like how when you have an anxiety dis disorder, you. Um, you sometimes do what we call turtling, which is you just spiral down out of control, and it's really hard to get out of that spiral. And um, I do put that into most of my narratives because I don't know how not to write without anxiety because it is crippling sometimes, uh, and it takes a lot to like to to get up and to sit in front of a lot of people and to and to talk about my experiences. So. So, Eleanor, you have not written about anxiety disorders or anything like that, but you have written essays for um, Modern Love for the New York Times, specifically one that you wrote about your late husband and his life towards the end, and, and you wrote another one about sort of finding love again after, and um, the, the, the way you sort of describe moving through, and you've written essays, there, you've got books of essays, not just the book we're talking about today, that talk about sort of moving through the grief process and um, how your son adjusted to you meeting somebody new in life. And how does that, having gone through being, being widowed fairly young and then adjusting to life after that, how does that impact your writing? Well, I found out when my, my husband, and I always mention this um, in public, he died of frontotemporal dementia because there's always someone in the audience who knows someone who has that or might be dealing with it. But what I, I actually, I found that I was a, a great compartmentalizer that I could just go to my office. I was working on a novel at the time and um, th that I was able to compartmentalize. I generally put the you know sad emotional things um, those go into essays, and I feel you know a duty in the novel to um, you know just um, you know satisfy the reader and amuse the reader, and I don't try to be funny. I just I found that um, my just point of view that I think I'm observing something some sort of seriously other people might actually find funny. So that's a very gratifying thing. But um, no, I, I can't really say anything very deep about that, that it's just, um, you know, I put that into the essays. So I see um, and truly found a lot of information about each of the three of you uh, on social media. Um, so, I know that, and you know, we've probably all seen that over the last 20 years, um, everything's changed due to social media, and certainly publishing is no different. So, with each of you being on various platforms, which do you like the least? Which would you be okay if it blipped out of existence tomorrow? And which do you like the best, and why? Let's, Jean. Let's start with you. Wow. Interesting question. Um, can, so 
I'm not a huge fan of TikTok just because as a Jewish, uh, very out loud Jewish woman, there's a lot of anti-Semitism on there and I've been the target of anti-Semitism on there. Um, but I am not on TikTok, so they find my husband. <laughs> so I'm not a huge fan of TikTok. Um, I wish Instagram gave me more words because I'm a author. <laughs> but um, so I guess Facebook, I have a wonderful Facebook community and every Shabbos, uh, I try to do a Shabbat post and everybody sort of says Shabbat Shalom to each other and talks to each other. So we kind of have a little Facebook family there. So Facebook's my favorite. Um, and I'd stay off TikTok or okay. TikTok and Twitter. Sorry, sorry, Twitter. Eleanor? Well, I, I wouldn't, I wish they didn't exist because as an <laughs> author, they make you, your publicist makes yeah, you do it. And it's funny you should say you would like more words because I would like, I don't like the long Instagram messages. And I try, usually begin mine with it says, you know, like self promotion alert that my new book is coming out with a picture of it. And TikTok, I don't do, though my character, I put her on TikTok. Um, in misdemeanor, and of course I had to check with some young man who knew about TikTok. <laughs> and Facebook, um, I do it out of obligation, but I don't want to read about, you know, I'm at an age that people are writing about their colonoscopies and their, <laughs> and their polyps, and, you know, and I'm just not, it, I, it makes me cringe, and I wish that none of them existed, but I think I would say I like Instagram the best because it's my briefest, and I'm not allowed, um, I'm not allowed to post pictures of my two grandsons, which I would really there are two and four. I would like to do that, um, so I would be happy if they were all they disappeared, go back to the old days. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh. Well, that is a hard act to follow, and I will tell you, if you liked Eleanor's performance here today, you will see it again in A Misdemeanor and several of her other books, because the dialogue is very similar. It's very natural, and, and I know Eleanor doesn't intend to be funny. She says that, but they, it really is. The dialogue is hilarious. Um, how can uh, I but unintentionally a colonoscopy? So. How, 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 how can I do that? Um, <laughs> you put me in a terrible position. Why didn't I go first? <laughs> Regrets, they're happening. Um, so I have, a, like, I think social media is very nuanced, and I think it really all depends on, like, how you best fit in in your community and, like, what you want out of a social platform. Um, I don't, I personally don't do Facebook. I'm on Instagram the most, but that's only because that's where I have the most followers, and that's where my reach is the biggest. Uh, Twitter is, you know, going the way of Elon Musk, so that's going to be doing something um <laughs> and uh and tiktok i think i think like from an author's perspective um especially a traditionally published author um tiktok's not really all that great for like an author platform it's it's definitely a reader platform and it should stay a reader platform um i think there are some spaces that authors really just shouldn't mess with um and shouldn't like insert themselves into conversations where like readers are talking to each other about about your novel um and i think the same way about goodreads and like amazon so uh so yeah that's 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 my take <laughs> So, talking about Goodreads and Amazon, do no. you read your reviews? No. No. <laughs> Only the five-star ones. <laughs> when I need a lift, a pick-me-up. You know, there was the exact minute when I stopped reading. It was a long time ago. It was one of my books called The Ladies' Man, and I was complaining to a good friend. who was My first editor was Stacy Schiff, the Pulitzer Prize-winning biographer, Cleopatra. Her new book is Samuel Adams. But she was my editor when she was 25. And I remember saying to her that I read this not very nice review on Amazon of The Ladies' Man. She said, you know what that's like? And this was way back when Hillary Clinton was just the senator in New York. And she said... You know, I, I was walking by and there was a parade and whatever the holiday was, and someone just was held up a sign that said, Go home, Hillary. So she I made so that was all I needed. That was sort of, you know, the um uh just the bad vibe of that. So I don't read them. But who it needs was, that? I it was want. a parade that Hillary Clinton wasn't even at? No, she was in it, but she was, you know, a new senator, just, and, you know, not nice. It isn't nice for anybody. Well, 
maybe nowadays I could think of someone. Yeah. Well, I like that you read the five-star reviews. That's I'm honest. Only <laughs> five-star reviews, folks. If you want to, if you want to, I want anybody to read your me. read your reviews. Like re re reviews will come to you no matter what. Even mm. like trade reviews. I remember getting this blistering trade review from Kirk is back when it was like my first book ever. Um, well, no, my second book, Heart of Iron. Um, it was a it was a YA duology, and the reviewer clearly did not like sci-fi and had a bone to pick with publishing. And the reviewer said, this book is angst-ridden backstory in deeply regrettable prose. Oh and I have that crocheted. <laughs> I, I, I stitched that into a pillow and I'm like, you. <laughs> I will remember you for the rest of my life. So I don't need to, to see other reviews because that's going to be the deepest the deepest, most terrible review I will ever get. <laughs> and you know, another thing that promoted my non-reading of reviews is um, I remember reading and loving, and she won the National Book Award, or maybe Pulitzer, or Alice McDermott's, was it Cousin Billy? Or does anyone remember the title of that book? So I thought, that is the greatest book. So I'll look at the Amazon reviews, because there's going to be the um, I, do, I shouldn't, no, I don't want to say, no, I won't say asshole in this, I'm not doing, but um, <laughs> you just that, said you know, it. <laughs> if, that, if that can get two or three stars from a crack pot, and then I found, you know, maybe a separate piece, or, so I, I, I chose, you know, three fabulous, perfect books, looked at their reviews and said, see, the world is filled with crack pot reviewers mm -hmm. with a mean streak, and what do I care about those for? And, and also, like, how, how people, like, you know, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, how, like, people interpret a book is, like, different per person because you're, you're going in with your own, like, lived experiences yeah. And, and, yeah. and your own, like, views of the world. And so every single person's, like, read of a book is different, no matter who you are. Like, I can read the same book as you, and we will come out with two completely different experiences. Uh, because of our lived experiences, and I think, and I always think about that whenever, um, like, I get tagged in an unwanted review or something. It's like, oh well, I guess you, something else is happening in your life, and you're not, and like, you you brought that to my novel because you know that that's usually what happens is like they, the world around uh, people like influences like how you how you read and and, and what you read. So yeah. Yes. Ashley, you you wrote something along those lines into the Geekerella series where one of the characters talks about, uh, you know, why do we always have, why does everybody have to see the same symbolism in books? Why can't we just read books and get out of them what we get out of them, and they, they just sort of mean to us what they mean to us? Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's interesting because we have that, and this is going to sound like a weird conversation to have at dinner. We have that conversation at my dinner table a lot because mm -hmm. um, my niece studies American literature, and I say, well, why does it have to be, you know, that... Uh, somebody in the Grapes of Wrath is, represents so-and-so, why can't they just, you know, be a, a guy? Mm -hmm. um, so when, when you all write, do, do your characters intentionally represent things? When they eat a certain food, does it intentionally represent something? Or is it just a happy accident when it happens? I wrote Let's a, start. Uh, um, oh, Eleanor, okay. I'm going to start with Ashley. No, oh, Ashley. me. Oh, gosh. Okay. Uh, Whenever I put something intentional in a novel, you will know it's intentional. Um, it, like if I'm like, oh, she's just wearing a blue dress that day, and I never call attention to it again, uh, it, she's just wearing a blue dress that day. Um, so there is this really great middle grade author, um, Owen Colfer, who uh, taught me a long time ago the rule of threes. And the, th and the rule of threes is that if something is called out three times, then it's important, and then it's important to the story. So that's what I've always like carried over into into my writing is if it's like called out three times, then it's important to the story. Otherwise, uh, it, it, it's your mileage may vary. <laughs> I use food all the time um, to characterize people, and it all started when I was in high no no in college, and I went home with my then college boyfriend to his mother's house, and there was another young couple. We were like 19, 20, and she served liver and onions. Oh, yeah, delicious, really. actually. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, which I happen to like liver, but I remember thinking that that said something about her awareness or her hospitality, maybe. So I, I in fact, I wrote an essay about this for Gourmet Magazine, but I definitely use food to um, mostly, you know, if someone is just once 
um, you know, hot dogs and beans, which I love, but then there are the, you know, people who cook with ramps and, you know, name another sophisticated food, creme fraiche. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so I use it. It's a lazy way to characterize people. So, for me, I think uh, all my books are sort of filtered through the lens of Torah or our Bible. Um, I don't think you can really write Jewish romance from a Jewish worldview without uh, the stories of our peoplehood. Um, and for me, you know, again, I'm a rabbinical school dropout. Uh, in biblical tradition and biblical study tradition in my tradition, we have something called Peshat and Drash. Peshat is like the simple layer of a book, and Drash is like the deeper meaning, the, the metaphors, the layers. Um, I think for my books, there's a Peshat layer, and it's the fun, it's the shtick, it's the rom-com, it's the happy ending at the end, but there's absolutely always a deeper layer. Um, there's metaphors, there's um, midrashic stories if you're Jewish, um, there is um, multitudes. So I absolutely, if you just walk away from my books with just uh, having a great time, I'm happy as a rom-com writer, but if you take more, then I feel like uh, then you get a little more. <laughs> so this is Jean's book, Mr. Perfect on Paper. See, I've annotated things. I'm not <laughs> reading to you, don't worry. Um, Jean, in your book, in Mr. Perfect on Paper, your heroine has a, a, she does meet her Mr. Perfect on paper and then in, in real life. Again, not a spoiler. I mean, it's, <laughs> um, but one of her most important relationships is with her grandmother. Um, and so when I was reading it, I mean, that really, that, that relationship really spoke to me because they're obviously very close. Her grandmother is old and they know she's dying, not a spoiler. Um, but I love this relationship because she goes to see her every day. She brings her grandmother and her grandmother's friends their favorite food. Um, and you just see the closeness. So to me, this is where, you know, the theme for, for your, your panel you know, sort of comes to me that it's not just uh, the boy meets girl, it's this deeper, these deeper relationships of family and tradition. Um, how much of you is in Mr. Perfect on Paper? So quite a bit. Um, from, so Mr. Perfect on Paper is an interfaith romance. I was a rabbinical student in my first year, went on a cruise, uh, deeply committed to my faith. When plot twist, I fell in love with a non-Jewish man. Um, and so I wanted to sort of reflect that in the story of what happens when you love your faith, but you love someone outside of your faith. And in terms of the relationship with Bubby, that is our uh, Yiddish word for grandmother, um, and the Hollaback girls, um, the way my family was, uh, I'm a third generation American. I am the product of pogroms, so my, came, my family came over to escape pogroms. So uh, I don't have like tons of cousins and all this, this stuff, but I had growing up a group of very fiery octogenarian uh, grandmothers and their sisters. And uh, to this day, if you go on a cruise out of Miami, you may meet a woman with that book or the matzo ball in their hands pushing it on you. <laughs> and uh, that will be one of my relatives. Um, and so that is absolutely the inspiration of like being surrounded by these strong, fiery, um, older women, I mean, for me, um, they really shaped who I became. So I love putting that into my stories. And Eleanor, I want to ask you, uh, first, I, of course, I love the title, being a lawyer. Um, the title is what caught my eye even before I knew you were going to be one of the authors on my panel. And uh, uh, so your heroine is, um, she's a lawyer, she gets herself in a little trouble, and she is on home confinement. Uh, so I know you are not a lawyer and you are not on home confinement, but what of you has made it into this book? Um, well, let's see. I think it's first person narration and my character Jane. I think there's a lot of me and just in terms of outlook, she's um, a little cynical. And um, 
you know, let's see what else. But oh, the cooking. I cook a lot. I cook a lot. And she has a little um, side job in the book where she has a little catering within the building, which is how she meets another person wearing an ankle monitor in the building. So I haven't experienced that. But I would say what's probably the most about me in the building is I used my building. It's a midtown Manhattan apartment building. And it starts off on what um, the character calls her uh, proudest and newest amenity, which was the roof was made into a terrace, and that's our uh, proudest and newest amenity in the building. <laughs> so I would say the, one of the most is uh, the uh, residential aspect of the book. Um, so that's not a very good answer, but um, yeah, you know, I just write one sentence at a time and I can't help kind of speaking in my own voice, I think. And, and before we move on to Ashley, I do want to ask you, uh, the first dish that she makes with the onions, is that a real recipe? That is a real recipe, boiled onions she makes on TikTok, kind of a little rebellion because her sister made her do it. Yes, I own the two cookbooks and they were published, one is 1896 and the other was 1897. And the first one, Hood's Practical Cooks, apostrophe S, cookbook, was published in Lowell, Massachusetts, which is my hometown where I was born and raised. Um, so yes, I own these two. And as you know, as a lawyer, the copyright has long been expired, long so expired. I could quote directly from them. And uh, yeah, so I did that. But everyone asks if I've made these recipes. I made the bread pudding my whole life, yeah. Do you have those cookbooks? I have those cookbooks. And is Great Aunt Margaret real? Where, where the, oh. who, who was the cook for the rich people? Um, Great Aunt Margaret is a character in Life with Father, you know, the Clarence Day memoir, and it was both, it was a TV show, a movie, and a play. And I make up the fact that Margaret, who was the housekeeper in real life for the Day family, was a great aunt of my character. This is not a major plot point. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Ashley. Oh, boy. How much of you is in this book? Um, that's a real good question. Other than a small town in the South. Okay, so uh, so it's about a small town in South Carolina called Maremont. Um, I'm from a tiny bit bigger town called Lexington. Uh, but a lot of my love for my family is written in the book. Um, my, my dad is my best friend, and um, I killed him off in, in this novel. <laughs> so this is, this is the second novel I've killed the father off, and so my dad is just like, are you, are, are you trying to tell me something? And I'm like, no, no, father, I, I, I am not, but, uh, but you do have good life insurance, right? <laughs> so, um, I, uh, my, my mom is, is a really, really big into ghost stories, and... Um, and hauntings and so i know she always wanted to like wanted me to write a ghost story and so i finally found a story that i wanted to write with a ghost and don't worry it's a happy ending so you don't have to worry about an unhappy ending with with this book um but uh but yeah so i guess that that, that, that part of me I wrote into it uh Florence is not all that much like me uh but her um, experiences in publishing because she's a she's an author and she's also a ghostwriter um, is very similar to what I have experienced as well. So. And the, one of the things that you and I talked about very briefly last night is you use the term in here mediator for a person who is able to see and speak with the dead. Mm -hmm. And that is a throwback to who? That is a throwback to Meg Cabot's Mediator series, which I grew up with as a teenager. And I I still have like the first edition copies of those books at home. And I go back and I reread them sometimes. Uh, they're some of my favorite uh, young adult novels ever. <laughs> so. was, was she a big influence for you in wanting to become an author? 
Uh, actually, no. Diana Wynne Jones was my biggest um, influence. I love Diana Wynne Jones. I think that she was a scholar of her time. Um, she should have been up there with Terry Pratchett, and, and like her name should have been known as like a really big name in in, in fantasy. Uh, but her books just never really got the same appeal as Terry as the Terry Pratchetts of the world. So. Eleanor, I know that you found your voice when you took a writing class, and that professor had some very good um, advice for you through the years. Yes, um, his name was Arthur Edelstein, and not a published writer, maybe a few short stories, um, but I, took, I, I kept taking various iterations and started as adult ed at Brandeis, and it cost me $40 for 10 weeks. So even though I almost chickened out the first night, I paid for it, and I like put in $40, so I went. And no, one of them, uh, uh, I'd say two best pieces of advice from art. One of them was um, prepare to write badly. So if you don't have an idea in your head or you don't feel inspired, you know, write some words down because maybe that'll lead to another sentence and another sentence and maybe the fifth paragraph will get you started. And another wonderful piece of advice from him was sometimes the best form of revision is to start something new. Mm-hmm. And that is a whole mood. Yeah. That is a whole mood. <laughs> like you and you've out. done that. Sometimes oh, you've yes. thrown away yes. hundreds of pages. Oh, I've thrown away. Uh, for Isabel's Bed, I had a whole other bad 125 pages, and I threw that out. And with um, the view from Penthouse B, yeah, so I don't have to go through everything. But it's very rare where I continue from the where I start. So I, But I sort of have faith in the process to know that I don't know where I'm going and I can be very unhappy with uh, a chapter or the beginning, I'll fix it, but the process is, you know, I'll make it better. And one of the other things that um, you were quoted in an interview saying that one of your editors said to you after reading your book, if I were going to buy her a gift, I wouldn't know what to get her. And how has that changed the way you write your characters? That was just my agent before she um, submitted it to an editor. She had this wonderful, I thought, it really helped me, because I'm not good at description, or it doesn't come naturally. I have to force myself, like, what are they wearing? What do they look like? And my agent said, if I had to buy April, the narrator, if I had to buy her a present, I wouldn't know what to get her. So I went back and I put on sort of like the dropped waist dresses that this same agent wore. And I gave her <laughs> like her immigrant mother's furniture. And you know, I don't do much, but that was very helpful. And then she, you know, I, she, she um, submitted it to Stacy Ship at Viking. And that was, began the beginning of a wonderful friendship. And Jean, how do you, do you flesh out your characters with, you know, sort of descript- a descriptive paragraph, or is it an over time a, a development? So I'm really lucky that my characters are kind of born like fully formed from the, my forehead. Um, but I, for me, the most important part is sort of the outline. But I, I really do kind of have an idea of who my primary characters are when I start to sit down. So I'm maybe rare or very lucky that I sort of know who they are and I follow them on this journey. Okay. And Ashley, how do, how do your folks come into being? Um, through a lot of drafts. Uh, I, I write a lot of different drafts of the exact same book over and over and over again. Um, and that's how my characters kind of come into being. Like at first they're like this one name and no, they, they do this next. And no, they're, they're this. I'm, I'm like a dog chasing a squirrel and I never catch the squirrel. Um, and, uh, and finally I settle on something that like feels, feels good. Um, and that's when I know that I have a draft that I can work with. And so then I go back and I flesh out the characters, but yeah, it's, it's definitely always a moving target for me because I don't, because as, as I write, I find out who the characters are. I find out what they like to eat, um, like who they love. And, uh, that's, that's a really important process to me, but that also means the first draft is just complete trash, just. Awesome. You do catch the squirrel. I do, thank you, but yeah. but like tenderly, I, I tenderly catch it and then I set it free again. 
And the, so for each of you, do you, do you ever find that you have put, you know, an act in the beginning of the book, an event that needs to move later or is mm -hmm. later that has to happen earlier? And, and how do you make up, make those decisions to move those things around? So I, I think I am a little different than you guys. So I was trained originally as a screenwriter at NYU. So I am a real classicist when it comes to storytelling and the three-act structure. So for me, I always start with an outline, and I always know like my beats, that's the screenwriting term we would use for the beginning, middle, and end. So when I write my first draft, it's a pretty clean um, draft, and then I just go through draft. I do what you do, and I keep writing, writing, writing until mm -hmm. I get to a point where I'm happy with it. But it doesn't veer too much uh, from that original outline, that 10-page outline I do before every book. And Eleanor, you don't outline at all. I don't outline at all. I, sometimes, I think it's just laziness. I think that would <laughs> take a lot of time to write, figure this book out. So I, but, but, um, so I cut a lot. I cut too much probably, in, but I keep a document, and it's sort of the graveyard of paragraphs and whole chapters. Oh, yeah, I do that too. Yeah, that I cut, and sometimes I look back. But this is slightly off the question, but it's more that I add, because I read this wonderful interview with Faye Weldon, who just died about in early, maybe late December, a British novelist. and. It was an interview with her, and she said that when she worked with students and she read their work, and they were worried, and they said they were stuck, and maybe they had writer's block, and she said, no, 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 it's not you, it's the work, which is about the worst thing you ever want to hear. But then she said, maybe you have to add someone, you have to add a character. And I found that that is one of my guiding principles, That, and I did it with... with um, in misdemeanor and in good riddance, it was just, um, I have to add someone, I need another character, I have mm -hmm. to open it up. Uh, and, yeah, I, I was actually um, also trained as a playwright before I, before I um, transitioned to, to, to writing novels. Uh, and uh, so the, the three-act structure is also like cemented, and then also the, the one-act structure for the one-act plays, wild. Uh, but. Uh, but yeah, so I, I, I always know that in the first chapter, I have to have, because I, I write romances, romantic comedies, I have to have the meet cute. And the meet cute is where the two love interests meet each other for the first time, and it has to be big, and it has to be memorable, and it has to be like something that also I call back to in the final chapters when like we're all saying goodbye to the characters. So I try to have, I try to make like circular narratives in that way so that I can like, start off a story almost exactly how I end it and, and, and mirror like a character growth and character arcs and that's how I like to like clean everything up and, and make a make a story. So we're in the Q&A period. <laughs> Ashley, how has your life changed since being selected as GMA book club? Mm, that's a good question. And how did you find out? Oh, okay. So, so I was actually on the way to a bookstore, a used bookstore, to because I I go once once a week to try and like collect the the series that I'm collecting at, at the moment, and I was in the parking lot of the used bookstore, and my my editor and agent both called me at the exact same time, and I was like, oh no, this is this is something bad. This is this this, this can't be good because because usually when they, when they both call you, it's not a good thing. And so I was like, hello. And they're like, are you sitting down? And I'm like, yeah, I, I just parked. What is it? And they're like, uh, you, uh, the Dead Romantics has been selected as the Good Morning America July book club pick. And I just started crying uh, because, uh, um, because it was something that I never in a million years thought would happen to my little ghost book. Uh, and so I had to, um, I had to get trained in like a media training, which was wild. I, I had like meetings set up and I had to go to like media training classes. And then I had to get a new wardrobe because <laughs> obviously you can't go on Good Morning America in jeans and a t-shirt, sadly. <laughs> so, uh, so I got a new wardrobe and, um, yeah, it was it was a phenomenal experience. Um, I I flew up to New York. I did it in a small little bookstore in a Rhinebeck called Oblong Books. 
I love Oblong. Oblong it's there. yeah. Oh, there's there's so they're so pleasant. Um, my my best friend's the manager of Oblong, and so yeah. So I was I was very excited to do it in their bookstore, uh, and like since then it's just been a really lovely time. Um, yeah. So that was that's it. <laughs> Jean, somebody was listening. What television work have you written, and for what did you win your Emmy? Um, so I, I uh, won my Emmy for Outstanding Children's Series for the show Assignment Discovery, um, which was on the Discovery Channel, and uh, for a while it was uh, North America's largest distributor of educational programming. All Beat out Big Bird. <laughs> all authors, and Eleanor, we're going to start with you. Oh, I love this question. What is something you wrote that was so outrageous you had to omit it from a novel? <laughs> Stumper. So wrote it and then cut it out. Because it was outrageous. Outrageous. Well, you know, I had a whole book that was outrageous. <laughs> um, Rachel to the rescue, and I'm, you know, I'm going to be delicate here, uh, politically speaking. I'm in Florida, but my um, my my character had a job that people thought I invented, where she taped together all of the documents, emails, any paper that Donald Trump ripped up. And in fact, this is a real job. It's the White House Office of Records Management. And um, so my character gets fired from that job and then onward and gets other jobs. But as it was being uh, distributed, and I'd never had a book turned down, so I just thought, this is gonna be a big book. They're probably gonna be all fighting over this one. But the publishers said they were worried about, by the time it came out, there would be Trump fatigue. So it got published in England first on American Election Day, and then Houghton Mifflin, my publishers, stepped up. Okay, so I would say that's kind of the, my flirtation with outrageousness. <laughs> Ashley? Oh boy, uh, are there any kids in here? Yeah. Um, so I write romances, uh, and so one of the, um, the nickname for the Dead Romantics was, uh, was, uh, was, was, uh, <laughs> was Ghost Boners. <laughs> <laughs> so the publishers so obviously bad. changed the name. I've obviously worse. changed the name. <laughs> So, uh, so, so yeah, like for, for a very long time, um, it was, it was referred to by that name. And then, then my agent, before we like submitted it to, to editors, my, my agent was like, so do you have an actual name for this book? And I was like, no, we're going out with that. She's like, no, we're not, Ashley. And I was like, you're right. No, we're not. Uh, <laughs> so I put my, um, my, 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 my undergraduate degree to good use. Uh, I was an English major and I like, uh, I, I, did a lot of studies with romanticism, so uh, I called it the dead romantics, and there's a lot of like callbacks to romantic poets, and yeah, so <laughs> it's, it's not called that anymore, but now it's called dead romantics, so there we go. <laughs> All right, Jean, outrageous. <laughs> I mean, I kind of feel like Eleanor, that my books are slightly outrageous in terms of like the comedy and, and the, what, the antics that happen, but I guess I'm, I'm more innocent than you two because <laughs> Um, I, you know, for me, I have to write for a broad audience and also a Jewish audience. So um, there's different sensibilities there. And so, I mean, for myself at night with a martini, I might write a scene, but it doesn't make it into the book. You know what I mean? Um, and that's because I have to write for, for different audiences. So um, my... Maybe I'm innocent, or maybe I'm just <laughs> hiding that side of myself. I don't know. I'll leave it to you guys to figure out. <laughs> okay, so I know the answer to the next one for two of you, but Eleanor, you are the dark horse in, in this one. Can you comment on your next book or project? So Ashley's got a book coming out, and Jean's got a book coming out. So Ashley, and then Eleanor, you get to follow up. Yeah, I'm working on the next one. I think I have about 
80 pages until I, you know, cut most of them. So, yes. So my narrator has an estate sale business. So that's kind of it. And I crowd, I've never done this. I crowdsourced, the, not the name of the book, but the name of the of the estate sale business, and I was amazed, so I shouldn't, um, you know, insult Facebook, I was amazed at how many people immediately, like, like, like it was all they thought about, they came up with the names of it. So I end up, so far I think it's the name of the business is Finders Keepers, but somebody also, um, suggested you can't take it with you, which I love. But anyway. Um, um, Yes, so, so that can be a competitor. Golden Oldies is a competitor. So that's, uh, that's it. And, yeah. <laughs> Ashley? Um, I, I, have, I have three books out this year, actually. Um, no, I did not sleep last year. That did not mm -hmm. happen. Um, my next adult rom-com is coming out on June 27th. It's called The Seven Year Slip. It is about uh, two people who meet in an apartment uh, that's slightly magical because they are seven years apart. Uh, so it's a time travel romance. Uh, and uh, it's like the lake house kind of, but it has a happy ending, I promise. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I have two uh, young adult books coming out as well. I have a uh, Buffy book coming out in August, and then I have a Marvel book coming out in October. And Jean, I know three is coming out and four is in the works. So. That's correct, yeah. So my third book is going to be called Kissing Kosher. Uh, it, it's kind of a throwback to my first book, The Matzo Ball, in that it's about uh, the heir to a baked good empire. He goes undercover at a small family bakery in Brooklyn in order to steal their recipe for, uh, their world famous recipe for pumpkin spice babka. And of course, while there, he meets the granddaughter of uh, the, the small town bakery, Apatal Cohen, uh, a woman who is suffering from sexual dysfunction due to chronic pelvic pain. And this is actually my first book that kind of gets into some sexy area, but I felt it was important because um, we're dealing with chronic pain and sexual dysfunction and romance. Why not? Of course. So um, I'm really excited about that book because... Uh, I think it's going to be uh, a good starting point for conversation for lots of folks. And it has a happy ending, and it's super funny. So. And uh, did, did one of them go to Camp Ahava? All, so that is my universe. Yes, Camp Ahava is, uh, if you're Jewish, Jewish summer camp is a really big thing. Um, and so all my characters in all my books uh, at one point have gone to Camp Ahava, which might or may not be a kind of shadow organization for Camp Ma, if anyone knows that camp, so. <laughs> uh, all in upstate New York, right? All, of course, I'm a Northeast girl, so yes, Berkshires. <laughs> uh, and book four, does it have a working title? So I cannot really talk about book four yet. All right, but, well, um, mom's the word. Contractual the word. obligations. Uh, so, so, so totally contracted, but until like the actual like t title is out there and the topic, and actually because sort of everything I do is sort of a challenge to myself and sort mm -hmm. of like a, I don't want to say first, but like trying to do something different. Mm -hmm. I don't like to talk about it until it's like in, I'm sure yeah, you know same, this. Same way. I have, yeah, to, I I have two more rom-coms also contracted. Yes. So, so you get nervous. You don't want like, you know, so. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> okay, last question for each of you. Ashley, you're going to start first. Ooh. Favorite author, not you, to read? Oh, it's easy. I've already talked about her. Diana Wynne Jones. She's my favorite. Can I like have like a small like story time session? Very small. Oh no, one minute. Never mind. No, we're not going. Sorry. Ask come, me later. Come, it's come really meet great. Ashley in the cafeteria later. <laughs> As do Tolkien. <laughs> Eleanor, favorite author to read who's not you? Oh, I have to give three because these are all late dear dear friends of mine. Started with Carol Shields, who wrote Stone Diaries when she was dying. I said to her, "I'll always name you first, and then second. Anita Shreve was a very close friend, so I told her the same thing. And then best friend for forty years, Mamie Medwed, and this book is dedicated to her. So they're all wonderful novelists. So obviously my favorite authors are Ashley Poston and Eleanor Lippman. Poston. So sweet. <laughs> and Not that, allowed. Buy their books and then we, buy mine too. We are playing you off the stage now. 
thank you all for coming. Of course, the authors will be across the way for you to meet. See us over there. <laughs>